in a couple of in a couple of slides I'll show you a little checklist uh, that I created for myself and for the people that that were teach I've been teaching when when I came to Poland in uh, in 2008 my mission was to uh, introduce OD and OE I'm in the military I, the army back in the uh, late 70s uh, introduced something called organization effectiveness and they trained a bunch of people to be OD consultants and I was fortunate enough to be on that faculty to do that over over a few years and it's, it's still present in the in the American uh, Army and also the Navy and in that in, in that particular uh, uh, process now see I forgot why I was starting that story what was I what was I going to do the checklist thank you mm -hmm. good mm -hmm. Uh, uh, donkey Vale. So uh, when I went to Poland, it was to introduce OD and OE to as many people as possible, clients, consultants, to raise all the boats. And the, the company that I went to work with was a training company. And after uh, two years, I, I told the, 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 the woman that brought me to Poland, I said, I can't do this anymore. She said, Yannick, why not? I said, well, because the phone rings and it's, it's somebody calling. And it's usually not a CEO or a C-level executive. It's somebody that's been tasked by somebody at the C-level. Go find us a vendor, right? Go find, you know, do, do some research. Find three or four vendors who can do a leadership program for a half a day or a day or whatever, and then, and then pick one. So the phone is ringing, and, the, and it's in Polish, of course. And so by the time I get brought into the conversation, they were all excited, Yannick, we got another project. It? Well, it's a half day on leadership development for 40 leaders in this particular bank, in this particular place. And they're all excited. And I'm thinking, I wonder what they really need. Okay. And so years ago, um, at the beginning of my career, somebody from Mars Candy, I remember her, the HR director said to me, you know, John, I think there's something that I really appreciate about you. You're able to give clients what they need disguised as what they ask for. <laughs> I thought, that's pretty cool. So it, it's, it's not like bait and switch, but they say, could you do a training program on this? Yeah, but then I go in and do, you know, what needs to be done, if at all possible. But the fact that it's a half day, I go in there in the first, well, first of all, I say, well, I need to talk to some people before I do even a, you know, half day training program. So in the course of those conversations, I realized, geez, they need a whole culture change on, you know, this or that, or a reorg and all kinds of stuff. But no, no, no. We're, so after two years of basically doing, treating, simp working on the brown end of the pipe, you know, with people that are in the room because of a calendar. I just said, I can't do this anymore. And I was about to leave and, and go back to the States in 2010. And I had one more conference to go to in Budapest. Uh, so I went, I did some of the shadow of OD, which would be fun to do sometime. And I was doing this workshop. It was uh, uh, ODN. No, it wasn't ODN. I don't know who it was. And at the end, there were some people down by the Danube River. We were having drinks after the workshop. And I started talking with this woman sitting next to me. She was born in Hong Kong. Uh, she had been Gestalt trained, OD trained, and I thought, wow, this lady is smart as a whip and all that, and we kind of clicked, so we said, she, she, I went to London, did a project with her, she came to Krakow, did a project with me, and she said, let's start, a, let's start a consulting company, let's do this together. And I'm an Eagle Scout, right, and you cannot make a fire with one stick. That's why we always have co-facilitators in every single leadership program we do. There's always two for a variety of reasons, and it's always a man and a woman. I want that yin and yang from the very beginning, from 1987, always. And so, with that in mind, uh, we started a consulting company called Share Leadership International, and eventually she's gone back to the UK now, she commutes occasionally, but that's why I stayed, because it was now I can create my own organization and be about whatever we're about. And so, somewhere along the line, uh, a brand occurred, especially after this merger, and now the business community knows about us and we're starting to, you know, be known. So this is why, and I want to be known not as a training company, this is the reason for the story, but as a different kind of consulting company. And it, now, now our task is to differentiate ourselves from the big four consulting firms. But just as an aside, one of the firms, I think I can name them, uh, PwC, now that I've named it, okay. Um, one of the, it's actually the largest uh, firm numerically uh, around the world. 
their uh, Central and Eastern Europe group has been sending people to this uh, uh, leadership program, and they have now decided to take it on and make it their flagship leadership program for, for 29 countries all around Europe. And I'm like, so now we have a capacity problem. So now it's scaling is the issue. Now it's finding facilitators like Catherine here and, and getting people on board, business development people like Pavel here, and say, God, how in the world are we going to do how are we going to do this? It's like the dog chasing the bus. What's he going to do if he catches the bus? <laughs> you know? Yeah, okay, we got this. You know. Now what are we going to do? Oh, my goodness. Okay, so I've got a checklist coming about how to do this. You know force field. I don't need to go through this. But one thing that a lot of people who, who learn it, even in the graduate programs, it really disturbs me. Levine said, you don't move this quasi-stationary equilibrium by pushing on the driving forces, because it just means the, the resistors just increase. What you do is you, you decrease the restraining force, and then the natural drivers will move things. And if you can get a person, for instance, who is known to be against it, if you can flip them, now you've really done something. So you want to put your effort on the restraining forces, not on the driving. Don't sell the change. That's ridiculous. Talk about the challenge. Talk about how hard it's going to be. Talk about what we're going to have to reach down and grab in order to make this happen. It's, you know, we might not, this is going to be tough. We're going to have to really reach. I do some Aikido, and actually, Pavel is a first degree black belt, so do not mess with him <laughs> in, in Aikido. But in, in, in Aikido, when you're attacked, the person is coming, it's called your uke. One, two, three. Uke. Uke. One, two, three. Uke. Very important concept. They're your dance partner. They're like somebody that's been put in your world in order to uh, uh, invite you to develop your capabilities. Wow, this, I, it's going to take all I've got to, to match this situation. Like if you're a tennis player, you want to play against a really good tennis player. It's going gonna, it's gonna to force you to play your best game. So you go into an OD project or any kind of a, a conflict situation, the harder it is, the more excited I get. We, it's okay, if I, if I quote you just before we went on, Pavel said, are you, are you anxious? about this, you know, going in front of all these people. And I thought, and I said, I'm excited. I got anxious about the, you know, video thing, the, the computer. But I, I just get excited. It's like, wow, I wonder what this is going to call out of me. So I'm focusing not only on what I can deliver to you, but in that circle, what is this going to, what is this going to, you know, allow me to do? So here we go. We're going to keep going here. Le these are Levine's change principles. What I want you to do is this. Ch uh, thank this partner, first of all. Thank this partner, seriously, sincerely. And then find somebody else nearby and form another pair. So if you're in a trio, it's a chance to form a pair. Ready, go. So do that if you would. When, when you're in a group, when you're, when you're in a group and you make a decision in front of other people. When you make a decision in a group, when you commit to something in a group, it creates more account it creates more accountability.
asking individuals to commit to some new behavior alone. They have a certain level of commitment and likelihood of follow through. If you do it in a group where each person is making a commitment to change in a group setting, Levine and, and, and when I look at realize that that freezes or makes it more, it, it locks in, it locks in that commitment more powerfully if they make a commitment to someone in the group. In a group. Glass. Okay. You know, as a consultant, when in doubt, gather data. Yep, we're good. I'm, I'm hoping. So let me ask you a question. Hello. I know this is worth the whole workshop, this one, this one slide here. And we'll get to number five in a minute. I think the word freezes uh, is what kind of throws people off there. But let's just get a show of hands and we'll see which of these fundamental principles, I I'm curious, I don't know how many of them in your world would actually still be valid. How many of you would say that behavior is a function of the person, number one, how many of you would say number one might still be valid in various settings? Kind of, okay. Meaning? Meaning um, it's too simple. So depending on what actually a what constitutes a person, right? Is it rather an ancient definition of character, which is like as inherited, or is it something which has been constructed by a person's life and history? I would say yes to that question. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All of who they are. And their behavior is not only that, but what what, what Levine would say is the culture around them, the team, the department, the country. The patterning, I'm reading a book now about pattern, patterning, which is really fascinating, um, contributes to the B, to the behavior. So if you take a person out and put them in a training program, you get, a, you get one set of odds of impact. If you deal with them in their intact work group, you what he was saying is you increase those odds. That's what number five is about. If you ask an individual to commit to something alone in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, you get one level of likelihood if, you, if, if everybody in the group goes around and everybody commits in a group setting, it, it freezes means it locks in. It's more likely that they'll follow through. That was the concept. Yeah. So now that you know what it means. How many people say no, uh, uh, no re number two, it might still be valid? Okay, a few. Okay, mostly, yeah. Okay, number three, focus on groups. I'm thinking coaches. You, hey, you're raising your hand, sweetheart. That's amazing. Cool. Uh, so there's something about uh, individuals also need to be the focus. Is that what you're saying? Both. Yeah, absolutely. Both. Yeah, thank you. If you forget about the key holders of the play, you have no Absolutely. Absolutely. There's another thing that John That assumes that the individuals and the groups are made up of human beings in the not too distant future. I question whether or not we'll be just feeding the Great point. What are we going to do when we got robots and AI running things? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, in each group and belong to or each roles, I think the question is greater instability. Yeah. I, I don't know get it from the groups, maybe even not from the rituals and sure. everyone is changing and then it's sure. the instability. It's kind of refocus on get the instability in the group of all the things. You bet. I mean this uh, leadership intensive that we do is designed to take the individual very deep and even then, even though it's going very deep into who they are and they're rediscovering who they are, you put them in different groups and they're like you, they go to one meeting and they act like this. They go to another meeting and they act like that. So there's, a, so there's both of these, to use Barry's model, it's a polarity and both are absolutely important. If you only focus on the group, there's a downside. If you only focus on the individual, there's a downside. Great. How about number four? The concept of letting people set their own targets and goals. Does that still seem like it might be valid? Okay, about half. Uh, five, that if you... Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Attainable. I don't agree with that. Attainable. Because it implies a person not to stretch. 
if you set attainable targets, that should be that's what you basically said. Yes, that's great. In 1939, that was the language that they used, right? So nowadays, I'm absolutely with you. In fact, this large part of our work is, is to get everybody, uh, individuals and groups, working on what we call stretches. Absolutely. Right on with that. But it also says you have to have an influence on the target. And I yeah. understand that I have a leverage of that. Okay. And not just anything yeah. for the entire corporation. I think you could take the word out and just say let people set, uh, set their targets. And nine times out of ten, it'll be more than what the organization has been asking for, I, I, at least in my experience, if you set the right context before you ask them. Amazing. <coughs> um, so the one about number five, sorry? On the floor, <coughs> there, is a, there is still, at least on my side, a big challenge, because nowadays, when, when you have the process of setting the target with the people, very often there is an assumption <coughs> that it's considered to be a manipul manipulatory way to work with people. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a trick. It's a management, it's a management trick. Yeah. yeah, it's a management trick. Yeah, yeah. And the people uh, know what is the expectation. Sure. So my sense is that, I don't know what these other people experience about it, but my sense is that this one is very important and there is a different piece of work that they have done because at the time of the win, that was, it was new. Now it's not new, but it's still relevant. And I think what you said, uh, there's, a, there's a whole two-day workshop and what I said at the beginning, setting the context for the workers to make those, to set those targets, that's where the, that's where, that's where the gold is. You know, if, if they just come in off the job and sit down and you say, what targets do you want to hit? They're going to say, what can I, what am I capable of right now, given all the givens? But if you do some, like, you know, breakthrough thinking and other stuff with them, and if, if, if management can somehow prove to them by authenticity and other things, hey, this is not a trick, you know, something, then there's a lot, there's a whole lot around the context for that. Are you, know, you just scratching? Be careful, I'm a Gestalt therapist, so I notice everything, okay? Number six, those who, those who do the work know what needs to be done. Can there be any argument about that? You have an argument? No, okay. I mean, why aren't you all raising your hands for that? No, oh, number five? Yeah, okay, five. If, if you want people to commit to something, do it in a group, is what Kurt Levine says, because the group creates a kind of a extra accountability. I'm, I'm not just promising, I'm promising something in front of my colleagues. Actually, uh, I, I agree and disagree. So, what happens if the group is doing bad things? Uh, not on my watch. They don't know, I mean... They don't know how to change. They don't know they need to change. So, th this, is, this is a long conversation. Am I in the room? How long have I been in the room? What's been the process up to that point? There's a whole lot of things I think that would need to come into play there. You're saying you don't want them to just lock. This is what, I mean, this is why, this is why dictators work. Everybody, you know, salutes or does whatever they do in front of a big group. They are locking them, that, that, that commitment gets locked in because of the, there's a kind of a group think which can be positive or negative, absolutely. Watergate and a bunch of other things, Bay of Pigs, Great examples of that. I want to build on this as around the concept of freezing. We went all in a circle and you told us to sit in a different way. And we sat in a way that is not a circle anymore. Yeah. And we are an audience to you. I'm the, I'm the expert here, yeah. Now you are the expert. Mm -hmm. Now you are the, the guru. And I personally feel free into this setting. So it's the word freeze meaning locked in rather than... It's so trapped, trapped is what I'm hearing. Yeah. And, okay. And, and the challenge there is that, and I go back to my intervention, is what's in the back of the mind of, of the group? What is the unconscious of the group? As the group itself can freeze people for different reasons in different ways. It has a power, and, and, and it's important that it's critical. And, and I say this referring to the here and now. Yeah. That we are critical on how we are freezing ourselves. Having been talking so much about a leadership figure and now finding it hard to have a conversation and having you always answer to us. Which like you're asking me and then you, you have a question and I give the answer kind of thing. Is that, yeah, that's, the, that's, that's the paradigm we've set here in the last hour. To shape in a, in a whole system conversation. Mm -hmm. Because other we go is more good. 
Mm -hmm. Or when we come to you, there's a back and forth. Now I'm talking to you. And, and, and <laughs> Let me ask you this. Why, why are you speaking now? Maybe somebody else. Maybe I don't care. I don't that's, care. That's, that's right now. Is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm being autocratic. I'm being autocratic. Yeah. yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, well, let me push back. You push, I push. It's Aikido. Come on. Let's do it. No, you're my, no, no, don't pull in the back now. You're raising a really important thing. Anybody who stands in front of the room and says anything is exercising a certain kind of authority. The question is, is it shared? It might, I don't know what the right answer is. I'm just telling you my philosophy here. Like, do I want to have this whole group talk about number five? Absolutely not. I got more stuff I want to do with you. My assignment was to do a cover territory. I can make the case who gives a shit about the, about the curriculum, but I'm in, a, I'm, in a, I'm in a polarity here between, as always, in our leadership intensive, we got five things that need to be covered in four, in, in four days. There's that, and there's what's right now. So I was with the Maasai. We take people to the Maasai quite often in Africa to work with on stuff, and to learn from the Maasai, basically. And the first time I went, I traded my wristwatch my binoculars and stuff to this warrior for a spear and a shield and two days later I went to my friend Kakuta one of the elders young elders and I said Kakuta I'm really stuck he said brother what is it I said I'm lost man he said why I said I don't know what time it is without my watch and he gave me this leather thing with beads beautiful thing and I said what is this he said this is a Maasai wrist watch and I'm an Eagle Scout I figured put a toothpick up here and do something with the Sun you know I said well how does it work he pointed to it said it's time to be doing exactly what we're doing right now. And I got it. So this is clock time, which is it's, it's 20 minutes to one. You have 10 minutes, John, left in your presentation. Where are you, which slide are you supposed to be on now? And this is, what is it time for right now? What is this moment requiring of me right now? And right now, this moment is requiring me to speak to my friend who's raised a huge issue about my use of authority in this room and every other room that I'm in, and I'm assuming any other room that you're in. So we either go with a, enough time to deal, we have very simple things to focus on, a very small number of those, and we do all the stuff that we've learned how to do to get a group of 53, it was 54 before I started, uh, people to deal with things in a kind of a consensual model, or we allow somebody to say, yeah, I'm gonna let you be in charge for this time and I'm going to turn my internal I'm not going to turn my internal authority over I'm going to let you influence me and from my point of view all of those on that continuum are okay but for some people they're not like telling like in the military there's you know the the Tannenbaum and Schmidt continuum right <clears throat> one two three four five tell right full rudder all ahead two-thirds I'm the I'm the officer of the deck on a ship it didn't happen in these collisions I guarantee you that uh, I'm the officer of the deck, I say, right full rudder. That's not the time for the helmsman to say, well, what do y'all think about that on the bridge? You put the rudder over and we'll talk about it later. That is absolutely the appropriate kind of exchange of authority in that moment. Otherwise, you can't do it. All the way over to, what do y'all think we should do? When, I went, when, when something broke and I would go to my team, I'm not an expert. They all know more than I do about the radar equipment and stuff. I'd say, hey guys, what do you think we should do? Well, we've talked about it, Mr. Sharon. We think we should do this. And then it's my job to say, okay, let's do it. I don't, I'm not the expert in there, but I'm the guy that's still responsible. I'm still the guy responsible for delivering some kind of content to you all. And there's, and there's a bell curve of receptivity and readiness and all the rest of that. So I'm now down to seven minutes. <laughs> but I think it was worth it. Thanks. So here we go. Uh, we're almost done. Break paradigms, I'm assuming the concept here is to do it with the people involved, not with a small, you know, the experts or the executives. And finally, force field is a good way to start. How many people think the force field might still be a relevant model? Uh-huh, force field. Okay. All right. Here's the checklist. I just took the steps in the consulting process here, and in my process, you'll have your own. And then I said, when I look at this last project, how much of, a, of an action research or a, a true engagement, how, how, how high, what was the level of engagement of the, of the people in this particular step of what I did? And, and next time, is there a way to move toward the right? 
like you know, initial contact with the CEO only, you know, and all this. So when you get the checklist, please use it if you find it relevant and useful. You want to be moving, if you want to follow the, the, the fundamental print, here's the concept. If you think some of what those folks were onto at the beginning is still valid, that more of, more, uh, of an engagement is, is, is uh, useful on some of these or all of these, then use this as a way of being more conscious about how you're going to, how much engagement of other people are you going to use. I did that before this session. I mean, I have, I have twos built in. It's, me, it's not just me tipping my hat to engagement. I want you all to digest pieces and then go to the next piece and digest that piece and go to the next piece. But it's a, it's, you know, everything's a compromise there. So here's what happens in Poland. The people in the executive suite and the millennials and then the middle managers, they're the guardians of the old way. The executives are saying, we gotta, we gotta create change. The millennials are saying, let's go. And the people in the middle are quite often saying, is this, is this accurate, Pavel, in the middle? They're the ones that quite often have been given responsibility and, and feel like they're responsible for holding, holding things a little bit more careful. Let's just don't jump, okay? So when you're doing OD in a place like Eastern Europe, where people look up to make sure they don't make a mistake, they don't want to, you know, and the, and the sea level want to have an entrepreneurial, inventive, courageous workforce, boy, you got work to do in the middle. Because they're ready to do it, and they think they know they need it. So you got to work with them to be ready for the cool stuff that's going to come here, and these people have to be empowered and, 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 and made courageous to pass it on. So that's what OD is like in Eastern Europe. Well, if I'm called in, it means they had some kind of a, at least enough of a consensus that the sea level said, okay, let's do this. And of course, you have a bell curve in terms of how excited they are about it. But, uh, you know, uh, if, they, if, if I'm there, it means my first task is to get more alignment, help them uh, explore the whole issue of what are we going to do and why are we going to do it until there is enough of a, of a, you know, strong force to move forward. But this is very different than in China. So here's OD in China. These are, uh, I had 16 uh, graduate students in the PhD program in Shenyang, China. And, uh, and, and I did this exercise after about two hours. Um, they were sitting in two tables, uh, uh, two tables of eight. And after a, a couple hours, I said, okay, um, I'd like you to all stand up if you would and then uh, move to a different uh, location in the room and sit down with a different person. Nothing happened. And I thought it was a translation. One of, the, one of the young students, I said, could you translate? And he stood up and said it in Chinese. Finally, one of the younger students said, come on, Dr. John, let's help Dr. John. And so slowly they began to stand up and two people didn't move, but the other 14 moved around. And so this was very intriguing to me. And I said, wow, this is really interesting. What was that hesitation about? So I, this is, I drew this up on the whiteboard I said, I invited you to change. What did you think? What did you feel? And what did you do? Talk to a partner. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Let's, a two-hour exercise. It's supposed to be a five-minute thing, change your seats, turned into a two-hour exercise about the trouble we have here internally in our, in our environment with change. It turns out that I said, why did you, why was it so hard for you to, well, Dr. John, these are our seats. These are our seat. That's my seat. You've asked me to leave my seat. And the, the director, the, the head of the uh, Communist Party for Education was uh, kicked off and a little guy smoked like this. He came in at the end, he said, uh, Dr. John, thank you so much for coming to our country and helping us learn about change. He said, we're having a lot of a challenge here in our country, but we use the metaphor of the clock with all the turning wheels. It, we have lots of things moving, but some, in order for the clock to work, certain parts of that clock have to be rock still as reference points for the wheels that are turning. And we're trying to figure out which parts have to stay the same and which parts need to turn. That's the same question I'm asking when I go into an OD intervention. So they just have, you know, 1.2 billion, I don't know what the number is, people trying to figure that out. And so it turns out those people that didn't move were the faculty members. They couldn't move, absolutely. They said, by the time you're five years old, when you walk in a room, you know exactly who you can speak to, who you can initiate a conversation with, how you have to act around various people. It's just total, you talk about where the power is, you walk in a room, there is no, 
uh, assumption of power. Everybody knows where the power is, and it just is there until they do something with it. I don't know what's going to happen. I, I, it's, it's exciting to me. I can't wait to see where they go with that, but it's going to be different in China. So this is what was moving in the OD giants, curiosity and discovery, which led to the concept of action research, the concept of experimentation and emerging design, which we've used here a lot. Hats off to you guys, Inoc. Caring about the client's situation and their colleagues. Like, what did they care about? That's a huge thing. And then they had an academic base and a kind of a theoretical orientation. Today, what we have is selling, I'm, I'm overstating, I'm exaggerating here to make a point, okay? Now, please don't hold me to this, because I know a lot of you in here at Roman not doing that. But when I look at what's happening around the world in OD, there's a lot of selling packages and deliverables. Not a bad thing, it's just certain things can happen and then certain things cannot happen when you do that. One size fits all quite often. The big four consulting firms, they do the same merger process. I don't care, they talk about change. I've been involved with Anderson in the day, uh, McKinsey, Bain, BCG, PwC, and they all have the same process. So please don't tell me that you're, in, that you're uh, modifying it. And they care about the consulting firm situation and friendly competition with colleagues. Up here, Ron Lippitt and those guys, they, they, they were trying to help their colleagues. They were sharing knowledge, immediately sharing knowledge. With a, there was no internet. They sent letters. I've got letters from Ron Lippitt. He was sending letters to his colleagues. Guess what we found out at this thing? And now there's a kind of a, you know, we're going to keep this because we can, we can build more for that. And so there's a profit-driven orientation, which is a necessity. If you have a consulting firm, you have to do that. So just before we go, I want to do this. <clears throat> I want to go over the five questions, and I want you to think about them in the plural and the singular. So these, this, is what, this is what we do to introduce an uh, OD uh, effort. We, we put, we'd like the senior team to go through this uh, experience as, as a group. And this is the thing. These are five questions that change everything except the one thing that never needs to change. As a leader and a human being, you don't need to change yourself. You need to come home to yourself. And that changes everything. So if you want to come home to yourself, then here's five questions that might be interesting. And I want to give them to you in the singular, but look at them if you use them in the plural. It's a fabulous OD framework. First is, what confronts me? Um, if you are in the jungle and a tiger came up on you, what would the fundamental human instinct be to do? Run, okay? We turn and run, six million years of evolutionary intelligence kicks in. And the tiger's brain sees that small, slow figure running away, the yummy one with the crunchy center. And the tiger's brain says what? Lunch, right? So it, it, and it cannot stop itself. If you run, your chances are zero. But the people that live there say, if you turn and face the tiger, now he may still eat you. This is not a magic story here. But he'll stop and think about it. So the act of facing the tiger creates not a guarantee, but a chance, a possibility of a different outcome. So we say, if you're not facing one of your tigers, and think of it in the plural, if we're not facing, what are our, what's confronting us? A team can do this. An individual, a marriage, a relationship. What confronts me or us? Next, what, it, what are we bringing? What am I bringing? My hopes, my fears, my history with this kind of situation, this kind of person? What's the conversation I'm having that makes me hesitant? What is this an example of that, that makes me not want to face it? Then what runs me? And this one is unconscious. This is how am I on automatic? How am I in my default right now as a leader, as a human being, as a team, as a company? What are we doing that we always do? What is the, what is the pattern that needs to be interrupted here in me as a leader, in us as a team, in us as an organization or country? What's the pattern interrupted? What, what is the pattern that needs to be interrupted? And this one is what calls me, and this is uh, the why. What calls out from in two directions? What, is, what, what calls out from inside of you? What are the bone-deep gifts and the bone-deep uh, charisms that are just in you, that must be expressed in whatever, whoever logo's on the paycheck or whatever the... The, the work is, it has to be, some of that has to be there, else what's the point? 
My daughter Emma is a dancer. She's been dancing since she was born. She's in Paris. She's dancing in all the big musicals, and she's just amazing. If Emma were here dancing, she would not be dancing to impress you. She would not be dancing to get feedback. She would be dancing because she's Emma. You get Emma, you get a dancer. You get me, you get this. This is it. I don't know how to do anything any better than this. So it's like, oh, there's a whole, I, I'm going to have to tell Tove. I'm going to tell Tove, okay. So I'm going to go back to my roots, okay? Now, in the, when the native storytellers tell a story, they, they always say, I don't think it, I don't know if it happened exactly this way, but the story is true. So I'm sure it didn't happen this way, but the story is true. In the creation story, at one point where it says that the, the Lord created this and that, and the Lord created the oceans and looked and saw that it was good. good. The word in, in Hebrew is tov, T-O-V, mazel tov. So... The, the Lord, the Creator, created the oceans and looked and saw that it was tov. And the translation is good. Eh. Terrible, terribly inadequate translation. Let me give you a better translation. Now remember, I don't think it happened this way, but the story is true. So the Lord created the oceans and looked and said, yes, yes, oh man, that's what I'm talking about. Oh man. That's a piece of me out there in the world where you can see it. You want to learn something about me, look at my ocean. That's tov. So what is it that's tov for you? What is it that when you're doing that or being that, like what are you really good at that you never learned? Nobody taught me how to do it. Whatever I'm doing up here, I have no idea where it came from. It was given to me. What's been given to you that has to be present in your work and in your life? So that, what calls out from the inside? Take a team or a relationship. What are we really good at? What, what calls out from our circle? to be manifest in the world where it can be seen. And secondly, what calls me from outside? What is a need in the world that I'm drawn to, like the firefighters in the twin? <sighs> I talked to a couple of firefighters in a workshop I was doing in the, in the Bahamas, and we, we were scuba diving, and they had been given a special uh, treat by the city of New York as a thank you, and they were about 10 of them. And we were talking, and because of my military training, there were certain things I had to do that I just did, didn't even think about it, and I asked them, you know, and they said, hey, when the, we were from a different district in the city, when, when we heard, when we saw it, we just went, you know. So it's like, what is it that calls you? In small towns in America, they don't have, uh, where well, they don't have fire departments because the cities are so small. They have volunteer fire, firefighters. So when the siren goes off, everybody in the city hears the siren, but some hear the call. <laughs> So what are we called to? The whole world is hearing the sirens right now. There's noise everywhere. But what is the sound? What is the sound that we go toward? What is the call to us? See. And then lastly, what will unleash me or unleash you? And this is where we work with the shadow and stuff like that. Like you don't need more persona. You just need a little bit from the shadow and off you go. I think there's something else here. So... Um, I'd like to get a couple of snaps for those five questions, if it's possible. Because I, I'm milking it. I'm milking it. Sorry. Thank you. No, 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 no. Wait, wait, wait. Thank you for that. But I was writing when I wrote my book, uh, Five Questions. I was stuck, and I have this paper. It's like a mind map. I have a picture of it somewhere. And after a couple of hours of just agonizing, fill this whole thing. I could still see it down in the bottom right-hand corner. said, John, you need to come home to yourself. And the book will come from that place. And that's what's at the core of who I am. It's like, just come home to ourselves. So every work that we do is focused on the individual and the group. How can this individual come home to himself or herself in the context that they find themselves, whether it's a family or the group? And I think there's something else here. We don't have time for it because I'm gone. We're, we're, I'm, I took time. I thought I knew it was time for something else in the middle of this thing, and I took time for that. But basically, one thing I'm taking away from this, um, and then let, let me go back here. So <clears throat> I want you to come up with one or two words to describe this last hour and a half for yourself. I'm going to count to three. I want you to all say it out loud, if you would, if you're, in, you're invited to say the word out loud. You ready? One, two, three. 
Thank you for the feedback. It's very, <laughs> very helpful. Uh, Marcus and Monique were the two people that I dealt with coming in here. Thank you for the invitation. This is fabulous. Um, I think, uh, what, what did I forget to do, Pavel? I was supposed to ask. Oh, yeah. Okay, the leadership program based on the five questions. We're, we have one scheduled for INOC people uh, just for, just for uh, uh, OD consultants. And uh, if you, what, what should they do? Email me or? Okay. Okay, and also if you want the newsletter, yeah, we have a leadership thing. Okay, that, no more selling, sorry for that. But we do, but I want to stay in touch with you all if you're interested. And we're, we have uh, uh, Catherine and Pavel if you want to talk about any of that stuff. <sighs> one th hang on, one thing we do. Uh, no, I'm going to give it away for free. We do a thing after every meeting with our clients called Rate This Meeting, RTM, from one to five. Above the waterline in terms of the content, how interesting, useful, compelling were the ideas. Below the waterline, what's happening at the emotional level in terms of my connection with myself and the people around me. And you throw your fingers. So I'm going to first do above the waterline, how one is, you know, waste, total waste of time. Five is very compelling, interesting uh, information. Okay, first information, one, two, three. And then you look around the group, you're looking for, you know, any ones or twos, and then you do a thing about that. Okay, thank you. Below the waterline in terms of what happened to you here and in yourself and with your connection with the people around you. One, two, three. And you look around for ones and twos and threes. Cool. Thank you for that. And uh, it's been an absolute delight. And we're here for the rest of the day. And I think we're leaving early tomorrow morning. Thank you very, very much for that. And it was awesome.